Well, it's the start of day three, and we haven't even finished the sterilization procedures from day two yet. Even suppositories are required to eliminate as much bacteria within the human body as possible. Nutrient drinks are on tap. Nothing with sugar because it can serve as a food source for bacteria. And even coffee has to give way to caffeine tablets. Or if the situation is dire enough, amphetamines. But it's finally time for the real laboratory work to begin. First confirming the lethality of the contagion with exposure of the scoop satellite to both a rat and a monkey to make sure that the likely cause of this trouble is indeed the satellite. Something strange certainly happened with the scoop satellite. They're given a transcript of the incident, and some kind of anomaly occurred around the 96-hour mark into the mission. Some kind of collision. After confirming that there is no sign that this was deliberate Soviet activity, and ruling out the likelihood of space junk, the consensus is that they are likely dealing with some small meteor with the implication that this is some kind of extraterrestrial life form. This isn't a given, though. That's only one of three scenarios proposed for what Scoop might recover. The second possibility is that sometime in the eons of history, microbes could be ejected from the Earth and are only now being recovered, being reintroduced into a biosphere that has long evolved beyond them. The third is the possibility that the humans themselves unwittingly did this, launching contaminated objects into space, where the microbes then mutated and are returning to Earth. Crichton tries to consider every single possibility, since he, after all, has to be speaking to the combined efforts of his entire fictional scientific development and the teams of geniuses in their fields. This is reflected with the sentiment in the book, The Rule of 48, named because for years it was considered fact that there were 48 chromosomes in a human cell, but when it was discovered that there were only 46, a search of the old research material did indeed show only 46 present. The book gives the interpretation of the rule of 48 as, all scientists are blind, because the evidence was right there, but they simply couldn't see it because of their preconceptions insisting that it was something else they were seeing. This is, of course, the danger of doing this kind of work, a reflection of the human frailties, or rather, human strengths that are actually weaknesses in this particular situation. You do things without thinking about doing them because you need your brain to be focused on the important details. You don't think about every single movement of a limb when you walk into the next room to get a glass of water. Because why should you? You could take for granted that all these motions that you've done a thousand times before will be applicable in every step. Stopping and thinking about each part, no matter how trivial, is difficult to do naturally. Never mind in a dangerous situation like this where every moment can count. The only way to achieve this, then, is to force oneself to do every single thing. That's the best way to accomplish this, even when it's frustrating. This is how the Andromeda strain takes the detective story and twists it because of the nature of the difference between crime and science. While detectives have procedures and techniques, time is frequently a factor in their investigations, because every moment increases the likelihood of lost evidence, someone with knowledge being unavailable, or the perpetrator covering their tracks or escaping. So detective stories usually show a follow-the-evidence technique. This is not to say that detectives are not thorough, but that they will be more inclined to finish their preliminary investigation into it and then pursue a course of action following up on clues and leads and suspects. But in science, when it's done properly, following the evidence in this manner leaves room for overlooking something, something that contradicts previously assumed facts. A detective does not have to contend with a murderer that might be able to walk through walls, turn invisible, or be capable of being in two places at once. But when a new phenomenon is observed, it might demonstrate that previously understood techniques was actually incomplete, and that reasonable assumptions are, in fact, wrong. For this reason, the pursuit that we see is grounded in the mundane, rigorous adherence to procedure to ensure that, in their excitement over a new clue, they don't potentially miss any other clues. Something new and exciting? Well, that's great, but we'll study it in greater detail once we finish the procedure in its entirety. Now it's time for getting down to those details. Hall is sent off to deal with the two survivors, as he is a practicing physician. 
Burton will be in charge of the autopsies and also the vector experiments. The latter should have been left to Levitt, but with their fifth man down, Levitt is better suited to aid Stone in examining events. Hall finds the unit where the patients wait impressive. Rather than using hazmat suits, there's a tunnel leading into a suit that he and his assistant can just jump into and use to examine them without any risk of infection, but with no time wasted in changing either. Plus, there's the computer with the ability to get results and carry out certain procedures on demand. Plus, some simple reasoning ability, as it suggests that, rather than running a test that Hall orders, he just asked the patient for the information. Turned out the old fellow wasn't comatose as suspected, he was just asleep. The old guy, Peter Jackson, is in his 60s, and a cantankerous old goat with signs of blood loss, and what blood he does have is ridiculously acidic. When he finally starts answering questions, Jackson says this is because of his ulcer. It's so bad surgeons want to remove his stomach. But he refuses, so they put him on a restrictive diet and behavior, which he also refuses. Instead, he takes a bottle a day of aspirin and squeeze, sterno squeeze through a sock like Prohibition-era hobos. But while his condition is all messed up, the baby's report comes back simply normal. How both these people could be the sole survivors of a disease is seemingly inexplicable. Burton has made some headway on the autopsies and similar examinations. For one, he's determined that while the disease can be transferred from the air surrounding a creature that was killed by the disease, if you remove all of that air and then introduce new air into where the corpse was, even if doing so causes it to burst open, the new air will not carry any infection. Every test was necessary to eliminate any assumptions. Like I said, you don't know if the murderer can walk through walls until your tests rule it out. Burton determines the approximate size of the infection as well, and then tests a possible way to resist. As Crichton notes, some diseases, like cholera, kill because of the symptoms. If you keep the damage that the symptoms cause under control, the body will survive long enough to recover. Since the autopsy confirms complete blood coagulation, he attempts to prevent the death by introducing anticoagulants into the test animals. But in all cases, the subject dies. However, the text notes that Burton makes a mistake by not autopsying those animals, because of his distraction as vector analyzer as well. It's no surprise that Crichton not only includes this, but calls attention to it. Medicine is notoriously complex and is rife with mistakes. Comedian Ray Romano once noted the phenomenon when you are in the shower and you forget whether or not you've shampooed your hair. Because you've done it so many times in those identical circumstances, it's hard to recall if this particular time you also did. How's that relevant to medicine? Romano's joking solution, bringing a checklist into the shower, is something being pushed in actual operating theaters for precisely the same reason. As Atul Gawande notes in his book on the subject, one of the four killers in surgery is infection, which can be prevented easily with an injection of antibiotics before the procedure. But when the anesthesiologist, who's responsible for that, has to get the patient calmly to fall asleep, and that patient is a scared, naked child waiting for a group of strangers to cut them open, and any of the normal distractions also show up, like the equipment behaving oddly or a page from the PA, Remembering whether or not you did that simple yet life-saving procedure is not easy. With so many things that can go wrong, it's no surprise that they do, and that even the doctors with the most important job on the planet can make one if, as in Burton's case, they've had too much thrown at them. Your procedures can anticipate everything, but it does no good if those procedures aren't followed. Case in point, while Stone and Levitt have discovered the pathogen, a green geometric shape that turns purple at times, they've yet to learn the crucial issues that aren't in their laboratory, but are going on on the outside. When they submit their limited findings, the new organism is codenamed Andromeda, but that's when they discover a collection of messages that have come through that they were never alerted to. One is that the president went with quarantine rather than cautery. Another is the loss of a phantom jet in a routine training exercise after flying over Piedmont. The pilot insisted all the rubber in the cockpit was falling apart, 
although there is no actual rubber. It's a new organic-based synthetic. Is he one of the victims who succumbed to madness, like the man who drowned himself deliberately in a bathtub? Or is there something else going on? It's hard to say, as the silence at Wildfire has confused those outside. Silence because those at Wildfire never knew they were getting any messages. Seeing that the old pin-fed printers that they were using, the kind where the paper was like toilet paper, all one long sheet with perforations, well, one of those strips of paper had come loose and fallen between the striker and the bell. So whenever a message came in, there was no sound to alert anyone. Even as they are using computers so advanced that they can revolutionize how medical treatment is done, it is still at the mercy of the most simplistic attacks. Thus we have the sad state of affairs, that however advanced we make our technology, it will still be incapable of replacing a human being. But the human being is fallible too. In other words, humanity has stepped up to gamble in a high-stakes game that it has no business playing.